Welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atu Kwesen, and I am a professor of English at Stanford University. This episode focuses on Titi Dangarenga's nervous conditions and the ways in which it illustrates the confluence of colonialism, education, and patriarchy in pre-independent Zimbabwe, which was then called Rhodesia. While the story is told from the perspective of Tambu, who moves from her village homestead to live with her uncle Baba Mukuru and his family so that she can go to school, her close friendship with her cousin Nyasha reveals a number of contradictions pertaining to colonial modernity and women's place in it. We will see how the context of Zimbabwe's liberation war is placed firmly in the background to the events depicted, and how the novel instead locates the women's position within a patriarchal system as the source of the nervous conditions of the title. We will also see that Tambo and Nyasha's youthful life stories define contrasting narrative arcs that move in opposite directions due to their completely different understandings of the value of the colonial education system. While for Tambo, education represents opportunities for self-fashioning and thus for freedom, for Nyasha, she understands colonial education as an abyss and something that cannot be disentangled from the oppressive patriarchy she experiences at the hands of her father. The novel is an excellent example of the Bildung's roman, as Terry Adams adroitly notes in his piece, Reconsidering the Bildung's roman. Titi Dangarembe's Nervous Conditions. Dangarembe's Nervous Conditions was first published in 1988. It was the first text to ever represent eating disorders in African literature and is narrated by the 16-year-old Tambujai, shortened to Tambu, the young female character who moves from the peasant homestead to the house of her uncle Baba Mukuru uh, to go to school. The novel is a twinned Bildung's roman of Tambu and her cousin Nyasha and details their lives as they evolve in different directions and across each other. The novel is set in Rhodesia during the Second Chimurenga War of the 1960s and 1970s. Chimurenga is the Shona word for liberation. The first Chimurenga was waged by the Shona and the Indebele against British-administered South Africa in the 1890s. One distinctive feature of Dangarembe's novel, as opposed to other novels that were set during the second Chimurenga, is that it makes very little difference to the war itself but instead focuses on the conditions of being a woman under the control of a traditional patriarchal system. The title of the novel was inspired by a statement made by Jean-Paul Sartre in his foreword to Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth in 1961. And Sartre says, the condition of the native is a nervous condition. Fanon's Wretched of the Earth itself centered on Algeria's War of Independence, which waged from 1954 to 1962. Fanon also reflected upon the problems of the anti-colonial elites, and the final chapter of his book contains descriptions of his case files as a psychiatrist in Algeria, tending after both Algerians and the French Pied Noirs, against whom the Algerians fought to free their country. The Pied Noirs 
were the descendants of French and other European people who were born and lived in Algeria during the period of French rule from 1830 to 1960. In this respect, we are able to recall the Creoles of the Caribbean and Latin America, and also the category of settler colonialism we discussed in our episode defining post-colonialism. Rhodesia was also a settler colonial state until independence in 1980, when its name was changed to Zimbabwe. Dangaremba's invocation of Sartre and Fanon to frame the lives of the women in her novel then serves to highlight the fact that it is the confluence of colonialism and patriarchy that creates the nervous conditions for them. This distinguishes Dangaremba's novel from those of other renowned Zimbabwean writers such as Yvonne Vera, Dambudio Marachera, and Chanjerai Hovi, among others, all of whom wrote literature from the 1980s onward in direct conversation with the Second Chimurenga War. Almost 20 years after Neville's Conditions, uh, and it is a novel that many consider to be a classic of African literature, Dangaremba also published The Book of Not and A Mournable Body, both of which feature Tambu in the central role, but this time engaging more directly with the Liberation War and its aftermath. Neville's Conditions focuses in large part on the constitution of a Western educated set of elite natives in the period leading up to independence. The novel shows that becoming part of the native elite under colonialism involves a number of contradictory processes including various degrees of linguistic alienation from the Shona language. This alienation is depicted most strongly in the character of Namo, Tambu's older brother, who on vacation back to the village homestead from Baba Mukuru's house, where he had been sent to go to school, he seems to completely forget his Shona and to speak only in English. And this is what we see. Then, when Namo came home at the end of his first year with Baba Mukuru, you could see he too was no longer the same person. The change in his appearance was dramatic. He had added several inches to his height and many to his width, so that he was not little and scrawny anymore but fit and muscular. Vitamins had nourished the skin to a shiny smoothness, several tones lighter in complexion than it used to be. His hair was no longer arranged in rows of dusty, wild, cucumber tufts, but was black, shiny with oil, and smoothly combed. All this was good, but there was one terrible change. He had forgotten how to speak Shona. A few words escaped haltingly, ungrammatically, and strangely accented when he spoke to my mother. But he did not speak to her very often anymore. He talked most fluently with my father. They had long conversations in English, which Namo broke into small, irregular syllables, and which my father chopped into smaller and even rougher phonemes. Father was pleased with Namo's command of the English language. He said it was the first step in the family's emancipation, since we could all improve our language by practicing on Namo. 
but he was the only one who was impressed by this inexplicable state my brother had developed. The rest of us spoke to Namo in Shona, to which, when he did answer, he answered in English, making a point of speaking slowly, deliberately, enunciating each syllable clearly so that we could understand. This restricted our communication to mundane, insignificant matters. But the situation was not entirely hopeless. When a significant issue did arise so that it was necessary to discuss matters in depth, Namus Shona, grammar, vocabulary, accent, and all would miraculously return for the duration of the discussion, only to disappear again mysteriously once the issue was settled. The more time Namu spent at Baba Mukuru's, the more aphasic he became, and the more my father was convinced that he was being educated. My mother was alarmed. She knew that the mission was a Christian place. Nevertheless, she maintained that the people there were ordinary people. She thought someone on the mission was bewitching her son and was all for making an appointment with the medium. In addition to the linguistic alienation we find expressed in the character of Namo, we also find that the evolving native elite have a peculiar relationship to the indigenous cultural sphere. This is shown in the over-romanticization of native customs that we see expressed by Baba Mukuru as a way of exerting control on his younger brother at the homestead. But there is a degree of romanticization also to be discerned in Nyasha's attitude to the homestead whenever she visits. where at one point she takes up pottery as a means of being connected to what she believes to be her culture. Namu dies suddenly, upon which Tambo is sent to take the place of her older brother in Baba Mukuru's household so she can go to school. Baba Mukuru is her father's older brother and he has pledged to educate one of his brother's children to further the entire family's chance of progress. Even though Tambu contrasts sharply with her brother, in that, unlike him, she does not forget her Shona, she begins to experience a different form of crisis in relation to her village background. Tambo develops a form of nausea towards certain practices in her old home. The ideas of hygiene that she absorbs through her school and from Baba Mukuru's family now make her experience a sense of uncontrollable revulsion at what she sees as the unhygienic practices in her own home. This feature of nausea was also an effect of the colonial education system. Finally, and perhaps most damagingly, is a growing and sometimes insurmountable ambivalence about the self in relation to its own past, as well as in relation to one's new and evolving social relationships. Tambo begins to experience a sense of euphoria on first leaving the homestead to go and live with Baba Mukuru. But this euphoria gets progressively mixed with ambivalence about her past culture, which might mean to her as having undergone a transformation that she thinks is not quite guaranteed 
by her Western colonial education. More distressingly for her character, however, is that she begins to develop a pragmatic calculus about what choices she ought to make in order to avoid tension in Baba Mukuru's household and also to progress in her self-fashioning. This pragmatic calculus shows itself most strongly when Baba Mukuru tells her one day that her parents' marriage was not conducted in a proper Christian manner, and thus that they are living in sin. He proposes to pay for a second marriage ceremony for them. The young Tambu, when living with her parents and siblings in the homestead, had originally been shown to have been spunky, critical, and fearless in expressing her strong, independent opinions. But when she's confronted by what amounts to a ridiculous declaration of her own sinful illegitimacy by Baba Mukuru, she's not able to tell him what she feels about it, and instead pretends to be ill and takes to her bed. Nyasha sees through her charade and tries to rouse her out of her stupor of shame, but to no avail. The pragmatic calculus is also shown toward the end of the novel when, on gaining admission to a prestigious boarding school to continue her high school education, Tambo immerses herself in her schoolwork so much that she progressively forgets to write to her cousin, an erstwhile close confidant, Nyasha. And this is despite the fact that Nyasha has suffered a major nervous breakdown just before Tambo's admission to the boarding school. Her forgetting of Nyasha may be interpreted in part as Tambu's attempt not to acknowledge what her cousin had always insisted in telling her, namely that the colonial education system was just a way of turning them, as girls and women, into mindless and unquestioning automatons in the hands of the patriarchal system. Nyasha's breakdown, as we shall see in a moment, was the product of her recognition of the vacuity of the education that they were being given and her strong critique and resistance toward it. Crucial to understanding Nyasha's rebelliousness, however, is the fraught relationship she has with her father, Baba Mukuru. Her father keeps insisting throughout that he wants his daughter to be a good girl. But being a good girl is really a cipher for being married worthy and by implication, a compliant subject. For Baba Mukuru, who has always been an assiduous student and dutiful and grateful beneficiary of the tokenism of the colonial system. He gains a scholarship for him and his wife to do their masters in education in England and returns to become the headmaster of a school in Rhodesia. That he achieves all this during the late colonial period under settler colonialism is testament to the fact that he has shown himself to be a good and compliant native. When he tells his daughter that he wants her to be a good girl, what he is saying effectively is that he does not want her to upturn all that he has achieved for him and his family and to show him up as not being able to bring up good and predictable natives. And the domain in which he and Yasha fight it out most intensely 
is on that of food and its consumption. But Okuru is regularly incensed that his daughter does not want to eat what is placed in front of her at the family table, but instead always has her nose in a book. And not just any old books, but books such as D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers and Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, the first of which she completely approves of and the second of which she derides as a fairy tale to tumble. She also reads about Arabs on the East Coast and the British on the West, about Nazis and Japanese and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. She has nightmares about these things, the atrocities, but she carried on reading all the same because she said, you had to know the facts if you were ever going to find the solutions. The running battles Nyasha has with her father sometimes turn violent, but it is when she is preparing for her final exams that the entire contradictory apparatus of education, patriarchy, and colonialism come together in an implacable amalgam that sends her into a nervous breakdown. And this is what we see. Nyasha grew weaker by the day. She weaved when she walked and every night was the same. Although we were on vacation, she studied 14 hours a day to make sure that she passed her O levels. She went late into the night to wake me up regularly and punctually at three o'clock with a problem, a chemical equation to balance, the number of amperes in a circuit to be calculated, or an irregular Latin verb to be conjugated. Although I was only in form one and could not often help her. I have to get it right, she would whisper in an apologetic smile. It was truly alarming. But nobody commented, nobody acted. We were all very frightened. One evening at supper, she passed out into her plate. It didn't last long, only a minute or two, but it was enough to overtax her father's precarious patience. Baba Mukuru, who thought she was making a scene, ordered her to her bedroom where she lay open-eyed and quiet all night. At three o'clock, she woke me up. Can I get into bed with you, Tambo? She whispered. But when I rolled over to make room for her to climb in, she shook her head and smiled. It's all right, she said. I just wanted to see if you would let me. Then she sat on her bed and looked at me out of her sunken eyes. Her bony knees pressed together so that her nightdress fell through the space where her thighs had been, agitated and nervous and picking her skin. I don't want to do it, Tambo. Really, I don't. But it's coming. I feel it coming. Her eyes were dilated. They've done this to me. She accused, whispering still. Really, they have. And then she became stern. It's not their fault. They did it to them too. You know they did, she whispered. To both of them, but especially to him. They put him through it all. But it's not his fault. He's good. Her voice took on a Rhodesian accent. He's a good boy. A good month, a bloody good kafir, she informed in sneering, sarcastic tones. Then she was whispering again. Why do they do it, Tambo? She hissed bitterly, her face contorting with rage. To me and to you and to him. 
do you see what they've done? They've taken us away. We grovel to him. She began to rock, her body quivering tensely. I won't grovel. Oh no, I won't. I am not a good girl. I am evil. I am not a good girl. I touch her to comfort her and that was the trigger. I won't grovel. I won't die. She raged and crouched like a cat ready to spring. The noise brought Baba Mukuru and my guru running. They could do nothing, could only watch. Nyasha was beside herself with fury. She rampaged, shredding her history book between her teeth. Their history, fucking liars, their bloody lies, breaking mirrors, her clay pots, anything she could lay her hands on and jabbing the fragments viciously into her flesh, stripping the bed clothes, tearing her clothes from the wardrobe and trampling them underfoot. They've trapped us. They've trapped us. But I won't be trapped. I am not a good girl. I won't be trapped. Then, as suddenly as it came, the rage passed. I don't hate you, Daddy, she said softly. They want me to, but I won't. She lay down on her bed. I'm very tired, she said in a voice that was recognizably hers. But I can't sleep. Mommy, will you hold me? She curled up in my guru's lap, looking no more than five years old. Look what they've done to us, she said softly. I am not one of them, but I am not one of you. She fell asleep. The next morning she was calm, but she assured me it was an illusion, the eye of a storm. There's a whole lot more, she said. I've tried to keep it in, but it's powerful. It ought to be. There's nearly a century of it, she added, with a shadow of her wry grin. This extraordinary scene weaves several elements together. The first is that Nyasha is keen to pass her exams, so is studying really hard for it. But it is in the face of what these exams represent, which is the gateway into a false freedom, that all the contradictions she has been battling suddenly come together. She astutely notes that her father's character has been distorted into the way it is by them. The them insinuating the colonial system which set him on a path to apparent self-fashioning when in fact it was only into a trap of glorified servitude. As an aside, we must note that this is a very generous interpretation of her father's bullying and insensitivity toward her that we have seen throughout the novel. Nyasha also points out that none of them are immune from the reach of the colonial machine, which, according to her interpretation, reaches even into the domain of private life to distort their basic familial instincts. Her rapid changes of voice from sneering to sarcasm to whimpering all go to show the multiple subject positions that she is adopting inside of her mind and the difficulty she has in reconciling them. When Tambu touches her, she finally loses control completely. But what Nyasha says and does during her rage are equally significant. She shreds her history book because it is full of lies, their lies. She also breaks mirrors, a direct reference to the shattering of her self-image. She also breaks her clay pots, which as we noted earlier, 
represent the romanticization of native culture that she's clearly now disavowing. But Nyasha is still her parents' little girl and her ultimate dependency on their love and care is what is expressed in her curling up in her mother's lap as though she was a five-year-old. And when she wakes up in the morning, she delivers fresh insights with special lucidity, stating that there is nearly a century of contradictions implanted in her. The century she's referring to here is the century of Rhodesia's settler colonialism. In this quite extraordinarily painful scene, we see that the nervous breakdown that Nyasha is subject to has different roots and etiologies. There is first the pressure of exams to prove herself as worthy for the passage out from her father's tutelage and control. Then there's a fragmentation and discord of her family's internal life that they have each learned to cringe and beg. And then there's the long history of colonialism that overdetermines all the parameters of her identity as a female and shapes them to suit the agenda of the colonial authorities. Even though Neville's conditions were set in the period before Zimbabwe's independence from colonialism, the structure of feeling encapsulated in the novel has a distinctively post-colonial feel to it. For the malaise that the novel lays out is not a malaise that ends with colonialism, but persists well into the post-independence phase. And so we find a similar structure of feeling in African literary texts as diverse as Aikwe Ama's Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, J.M. Kutsia's Life and Times of Michael K., and Bessie Head's A Question of Power, among many others. Thank you very much. Please refer to reading suggestions on the novel in the episode description below. And if you like the episode, remember to give a thumbs up, subscribe and share, hit the notifications bell, and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week.